For you, is there a dividing line between your politics and your art? Do you see a, a direct dividing line there, or or do they do they? I guess they merge quite a bit when it comes to documentary, but but when we're talking about like uh, your cinematography on other people's movies and so forth, is there? Do you see a line there? Um. I'm trying to think. Good. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what makes me the weirdo sort of leftist type of character that I uh, have, have developed. I do. I do remember when I won my first Academy Award uh, for Virginia Woolf, and um, and I was. I was when I was walking up to the to get the award. Um, I was going to thank Mike Nichols, and which I really I did afterward. But then mm-hmm. I said, you know, Haskell, this is the only time in your life probably that you'll be able to talk to uh, at least a million people. And so when I got up there, I said, I said, I, I hope we can use our art uh, for peace. And for love. Now, when I say that to you right now, it sounds so fucking corny. It sounds so nothing. But at that time, we were full out in war, a senseless, useless, unnecessary um, war. And, and, And the word love was something related to hippies. And hippies mm-hmm. were like, you know, guys These were with... incendiary words in some ways. Yeah, right. And girls with, you know, t-shirts and no bras mm-hmm. and that stuff. And so, so those were, those were revolutionary words. Okay, but then, but that means I hope we can use our art that way because our art meaning our ability to interestingly communicate ideas, and also. Uh, to learn, you know, I, going growing up, I love movies. I went to cowboy and Indian movies with my brother, mm-hmm. and I and I used to love when when they when the cowboy shot the Indian off the horse, you know, the Indian, and I would you know I would cheer and um and and say yeah look at him. Fucking Indian there. I got just got a bow and arrow. You know, they were we shot, and, and this this the movie was telling me stories. You know, the fact mm-hmm. that we invaded the country devastated those people. But you right. Know, so so to, to, to make learn to make movies that a lot of people see takes a lot of money, and so um, when I had chances to um, to make films with. Um, like uh, coming home, for example, or make you mentioned Mate One, or um, other uh, films which um, which question the establishment uh, when it's going nuts. I feel good because my mom wanted me to make be a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's sweet. I, I uh, remember my mom when I was a good boy. She put a star on the refrigerator. It was great. And when I was not. You know, I mean, even even like just today, I had I made lunch, and I and I put I had a, um, more food on the plate than I thought I would have. But then something said, "Eat it all," because my mother said, "Remember the starving Armenians." Right. What the hell? <laughs> I, I want to ask you about uh, your your early uh, your early life. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, do you do you remember when you first picked up a camera and and first uh, it, it could have been a still camera, it could have been a, an actual you know maybe an eight millimeter or something like that, and actually sort of kind of fell in love with the idea of a frame and framing things. Can you um, well, um, I, I'm from Chicago, and, and Bell and & Howell Corporation's in Chicago, and they made a um, 16-millimeter camera. There was no 8-millimeter then. And mm-hmm. um, my family, we traveled around the world a lot, and I took uh, family movies, 
and then cut them at home and and I I enjoyed that making stories and seeing things you know I was in Mussolini's Italy and I was in a lot of places that you know were, were history because I've been doing this for a long long time you, did you am I correct in saying that you kind of one of your earlier gigs in the in the industry was was working as a with uh, James Wong Howe? Oh yes, and when I came out to California, um, I um, I was friends with Jim. Jimmy you know, has suffered a lot of anti-Chinese stuff, believe it or not, mm. and um, and. A lot of the people uh, I knew were uh, sort of big, active in the beginnings of the civil rights movement to talk about black people, but uh, Jimmy Howe was a very, um, uh, you know, um, didn't didn't want to take any gaff from anyone. Anyway, we liked each other, so I was fairly young, and um, I, I worked on a picture called Picnic. I did... Um, Actually, I did one of the last shots of the film, which was one of the first helicopter shots. It was uh, a Navy helicopter. There were no helicopter rigs in those days. And and um, I sat on a two-by-four with a rope around me and a, a, a CinemaScope camera and got the shot of Kim Novak and went over to Bill Holden, who was on a, a training top, and I don't know, it was, a, it was a great shot, and and um, uh, it was that was you know that was sixty years ago. <laughs> was that one of the first? Is that is that among one of the first shots that you can remember seeing of yours on the big screen? And and, and... Uh, I, yes, I, I worked as an assistant uh, and uh, on the newsreels. But mm. uh, that was that was an important shot. In fact, when they showed it in the dailies, uh, I sat next to Jimmy Howe, and um, and then when the shot came up, and no, nobody had seen it. It's not like video assist that we have nowadays. Uh, I hadn't seen it either, and uh, it was it was good. And so Jimmy Howe said to me, "Oh, oh, very, very good, very good." And um, <laughs> you know, even today, when I'm doing a shot, you know. I uh, somebody you know, I hear that kind of voice, you know. You hear and, you hear uh, uh, um, Hal's voice in your head. When, yeah, <laughs> when, <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. He's also like a great hero of mine in terms of cinematography and and, oh, and yeah, filmmaking that's in general. Good. Uh, I mean, like uh, you know, for me, like uh, uh, you know, his 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 work on HUD. Uh, oh, yeah. Particularly um, memorable for me, and also also seconds. I, I love that. I love to work on that. But then his his career goes back in, even into the 30s. You know, like he did the Thin Man and so forth. So it's like, and and uh, his his use of his use of darkness and so forth seems to kind of predate uh, somebody like you know Gordon Willis or something like that. Like he he was yeah. he was unafraid to go in in dark into dark territories in some ways with who's playing Virginia Woolf uh one of the questions I wanted to ask you is it's so fascinating to me about that movie that 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 film seems uh seems the least stagey stage production you know a stage adaptation ever made and I credit that to the photography and to the art direction. I mean, did you have a very? How would you describe your collaboration, not only with Nichols but with with Mike Nichols, the the director, but also with Richard Silbert, the the art director? Did um, that's that that is really part of our job. It was the first uh, regular studio type film I had done. By regular studio, uh, you. Um, you're given lights on the around the edges of the top on the scaffolding. Um, mm-hmm. My my kind of lighting often had lighting more integral into the set um, um, period. And all, but also, uh, it was a learning process because uh, in those days, uh, 
they had a, a gaffer and someone with dimmers, and I never worked with that. In other words, it used to be if you walked across the set, a character walked across the set, you would have one key light hit hit them, and you put a double open in at the bottom, and and then come into another one to keep the, um, the density the same until they're coming into a um, to closer to a lamp or something like that. But all that, mm-hmm. if, you, if you have a good dimmer guy working with the gaffer uh, and the cameraman, um, that makes it so much easier. So the, uh, the same with me working with Silbert uh, on, um, on, on, on the color of the walls, uh, um, also working with uh, makeup. You know, Richard was... Um, upset about, he heard my documentary background, he thought that his pock marks would show. And, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, right. And, um, and did you did you have to worry a lot about, like, you know, I should tell you this, I met, uh, I met Edward Albee one time, like, back in the 80s. <clears throat> I met him, and, um, and uh, I asked him about what he thought about Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and his main complaint, he said he said it's good, but the main complaint I have with it is that um, that Elizabeth Taylor is, was too young to be playing that role. She's all right, she's that. too young. Because, you know what? When we were preparing shooting, and, and Elizabeth and Mike... We were standing in the set together, and Mike was saying to me, now, look, at Elizabeth is not supposed to look like Elizabeth Taylor, because, you know, we're, um, you know she's a different role. And um, so I said, um, oh, yes, Mike, uh, I understand. And then I was sort of nodded my head, and, and Elizabeth looked me. I saw her look from the side of her eye, and then... I, and I just instinctively put my hand on my waist where I had my light meter, and I, I and when I looked at her about through the side of my, I tapped my light meter, but I but that I didn't decide to do, but I found out later from her that she saw me do that, so that um, when um, uh, so that every day on the set before we go to work. And she would always give me a big uh, kiss and stuff, and I would uh, I would I would tap my light meter, and then we would uh, we would go to work, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, so then. Um, but it's interesting that that Albie said that I'll be damned, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh. And, uh, you got me on that one. Uh, I, w- I want to go a little bit further back to America, America. To me, America, America is kind of your your sort of your breakthrough role. I mean, you've been working, you know, as a as the lead photographer for you know almost a decade uh, before America, America. But uh, it feels like that is one of your first. First, I feel like that's your breakthrough in in terms of you know working with Aaliyah Kazan and so forth. And the the look of that movie is so amazing. It looks like a movie that was kind of unearthed, like from the '30s or something. Uh, uh-huh. Can you talk about how you kind of how you achieved that look? Uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It has kind of a. Yeah. Well, I, I, has, I I I I like I like my work in America, America, and I, just by. Happenstance, I I, uh, I happened to get that job because my uh, my brother Yale was acting in a um, a play called Tea and Sympathy that Gadge uh, Kazan um, directed, and um, and he's my brother Yale showed him a film I did called Steak Out on Dope Street, which was a uh, low budget um, film dealing with with uh, with dope was one of the first pictures that dealt with uh, dope and all in any way. And, That's an uh, Urban Kirshner that. movie. Um, what are we, one of a few okay. movies that you did with Urban Kirshner. Yeah, that's well, oh boy, you're up on stuff. Huh? And uh, so then, um, so then, um, Gadge asked me, and of course, uh, I had been 
one of the reasons that I have not been working in Hollywood and, and other jobs is because I had been blacklisted, and Kazan was um, not too... Uh, not thought of too friendly by the people who were blacklisted because he um, he didn't have to succumb to the blacklist because he was a, a, um, a Broadway director of really some stature and, and the blacklist didn't hit any of them. Right. But, uh, but anyway, when I knew the story and... Um, and so, and of course, I wanted to work with her. <laughs> um, and I thought the story was a really good American story about what America has meant really to means, so many yeah. people. Really means, yeah. And yeah. Um, so, um, so that way, so I, it was just a practical shooting. I had an Italian crew. Um, most of the time we worked in, in Greece and in... Um, and a couple of stolen shots in Turkey, Kazan gave them a fake script because, and um, and I had they had a, a separate crew, and I went out with my hand camera and got some of the Turkish shots that um, were in the film. Right. I just I just love well I love that movie, but I just love the look of it. I just you know um, I I adore it. Um, I want to talk about black and white. Do you miss working in black and white? Uh, because I, I I don't. When I look at your when I look at your um, your output uh, in terms of uh, in terms of at least narrative movies, uh, you haven't really worked in black and white since. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Do do you miss it? Well, there were big discussions at Warner Brothers or whether Virginia Woolf. I would be in color, black and white, because color television was uh, coming up, and they felt commercially uh, it would make it more valuable. And um, I don't know who the final decision was about going in black and white. I was very happy because I had not shot um, a, a color, um, and um, and I and also. Um, not known to many people, I am um, uh, colorblind. <laughs> uh, <at least. laughs> really? That uh, stuns me. <laughs> that 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 is completely stunning to me. Um, now, are you just red green colorblind, or is it like yeah. one of those? Okay. Yeah. But there, but I uh, I found from other people and from actually from um, people who know eyes, it, it gives you. Um, a, a certain kind of sensitivity on the, on the um, how much light back, comes back and forth from uh, different colors, and I don't I don't know all the facts, but it was one of the scary things about uh, shooting in the heat of the night, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, the whole colorblind thing has actually thrown me a little bit because, um, as a surprise, because. Uh, in the heat of the night, you actually made some headway into into photography of uh, of black people in that movie. You, you actually yeah. found a found a way to actually highlight their features a little bit more better than they had ever been uh, highlighted in other color features. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> I was just I was just thinking of a funny thing. I wonder uh, uh, Rod Steiger and Sydney. Uh, Poitier uh, were talking, and we were sort of uh, waiting um, for for makeup uh, on a certain shot. And um, so Rod said, "Well, both said, why why are we going?" And uh, so someone said, "Well, Sydney's in makeup." And, he, and so Rod says, "What do you mean in makeup? All he has to do is shine his head." And um, <laughs> and so they, <laughs> so they went into that. Which I wish I would have shot. You know, this is before we go into a scene about. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, actually, um, there, there there are different levels of, um, of of blackness and reflectiveness, and and also certain technical uh, light, lighting things that can um, that can overcome the fact that black does not reflect as much as as lighter. You know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
like having kicker lights, or liners, what they call liners, a light that comes um, from the back three quarters and hits the side of the cheek, and uh, also, well, just a lot of technical stuff, but I, nothing, nothing I really invented at all. Uh, yeah. yeah, nothing that you invented. Okay, well, um, mm. was in the heat of night where you met Hal Ashby? Did you meet Hal Ashby for the first time? Uh, Hal, Hal was um, was the editor. I I did. Um, I'm trying to think uh, whether I did the best man. Yeah, I think you did. You did the best man as well. Yes. Was that there? Was, that was before in the heat of the night. I don't know. Yeah, that's sixty four. Because yeah, because um, uh, that was black and white, and that, and that was no, that was that story was. Considered in quotes, political. Political means might be. Political usually means controversial, and controversial means counter to the established uh, way of looking at things. You know. And it still uh, means that. <laughs> I think. <laughs> but um. You know. But um. Hal Ashby was the, the second editor on uh, the Best Man, and um. And then also on on the heat of the night, and in subsequent Norman Jewison films, uh, Hal was the editor and a, an extremely strong creative uh, force for for, uh, for Norman. I uh, I, I want to talk about Norman Jewison a little bit, but I I do want to talk about Hal Ashby because we're such huge Hal Ashby fans on the show. Uh, the host of the show, Jamie uh, Jamie Duvall. Uh, loves him and uh, and he had a question that he wanted to ask. How did his how did Hal's approach of providing freedom to the actors extend to freedom for you as a cinematographer? Well, in the, in the real world, uh, Hal and I were were partners. We were both very active in the civil rights movement. We were uh, Hal had complete confidence in his own ability to edit and that is to, to make to make um gold out of shit <laughs> mm-hmm. and, the, and the job in the filmmaking is to not have so much shit that it makes too much work right to make gold. Right. gold i mean i i don't i'm sort of oversimplifying but um but he he was Good and also he was not above um, discovering things. I um, I guess it was. I, I'm not sure what film I did with Hal, but I know we were shooting someone uh, in, a, in the story going into a, a grocery store, and when the grocery store um, door closed, it said it said something word like exit on it, and mm-hmm. it seemed like. And it seemed like that fit so much with where we were at that point in the film. But that was just an accident. So he saw it in the dailies, and um, and it was there in the film, and it worked completely. I'm not sure what, but there were a lot of little things like that with Hal. I, I guess his editing experience really informed his directorial experience. To the point where, I mean, like, he's probably really the only, one of the few, like, winners of the Best Editing Oscar to ever move on to directing movies. Um, and so that kind of that kind of tells you right there that, like, it, it, one of his strengths was really, uh, really finding finding those uh, little gems in in uh, in the filming of movies. Curious. Uh, also, like uh, about your relationship with uh, with Norman Jewison, uh, and particularly one of my favorite shots, and I'm sure I'm sure if you polled really really hardcore film lovers uh, about some of their favorite Haskell Wexler shots, uh, they would mention the Thomas Crown affair and uh, that great. 360 degree kissing shot uh, between McQueen and and Dunaway. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about and and the the challenges that might have been uh, might have um, might have that might have brought? 
<laughs> well, uh, there was something in the script that said um, that they, they ch- play chess with love or something, some euphemistic phrase like that. And then, and I'm I'm known uh, knew Steve for quite a while because I had race car team and he was interested and in, he had motorcycles and we had all that stuff. In, in common, and he was very, um, he, he, he really didn't, he was afraid of doing that job because it was the first kind of job that he was playing that kind of a person instead of who Steve McQueen was. Before. Really was, yeah. But on that particular shot, I know that I had ideas of, um, some of it are still in the film about, about, um, about, uh, her on uh, one of the uh, chess men moving her fingers up and down like she was um, jacking somebody off. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh-huh. there was, uh, and, and then uh, so you talk about the kiss. Well, I don't know, just thought it would be yeah, theatrical, that's all. Just a trick. And I, so I, I, and I made up a curved dolly track so we could go around. Uh, I don't know, it's just, I'm glad you remember that shot. You know, there were a lot of shots I've done with Hal. I did one shot of a film we shot a lot in in uh, Las Vegas, I think. And I did a, when Seti Cam was very new, and then a shot that started on the, the main floor with a character and went in, into a, an elevator and then scene kept going and talking and then they went out and then um, moved into some other fantastic place. And I uh, worked that out with Garrett Brown. And then when mm. I saw the, saw the film, I said, hell, where the hell is that shot? You know, <laughs> it took, we ran it for most about three quarters of a day. And he said, it didn't work, but hell, you know, that shot. And so he said, look, it, when I'm at it, I look what the image says to me in the story. And, and that's why it's out, Haskell, you know. And, um, <laughs> and but, That's great that, that you had the, like, those kind of back and forth kind of things. Uh, uh, oh, oh I yeah. Mean, the, did the Steadicam, I know that the Steadicam, you used the Steadicam on uh, Bound for Glory. That was one of the first uh, times that you used it. Did did that just totally change the industry uh, or change the art of, of cinematography for you? Uh, well, gradually, it, it, um, having the image from the camera go on to a... Uh, video image um, freed the camera from being actually stuck to the body for like hand holding and so forth. Um, and I I worked with Garrett well as he was developing the steady cam. Um, and, uh, and when he one of his first things um, that he had was a fiber optic thing where he had on on his eye a patch and. and uh, and then Patch I had a tube fiber optics that went into the camera, um, and but that didn't work because he lost when he when he moved he lost his a sense of um, of uh, 3D of of, um, of he just uh, couldn't move well. And, right. Um, but then I did a, um, a commercial with a um, further developed one um, before we did the shot. In the, on Bound for Glory, and the Bound for Glory shot was stolen from a Russian film. The shot in the film um, was a woman is in a bus, um, on, on, and um, she gets out of the bus, and she walks through a crowd, and she comes to the edge of a street where there are um, you know, all kinds of Russian um, uh, um, weapons and and marchers and everything on mm-hmm. this big wide street. And as she comes there, the the camera goes up in the air and gets this wide. Cr- the cranes are flying. It's called cranes the are cranes. flying. That's it. That's it. The cranes uh, are flying. Yeah, That's it. That's what I was trying to figure it out. <laughs> so, so I 
So I, I, I was shooting a documentary in Russia, and I asked the cameraman, how the hell did you do that shot? And I thought there was some kind of super crane, and he said it was handheld, and then he stood on a, a big crane when he got near the edge, and he stepped on that, and then, and then the crane took him up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. But so Good. so that led to the first one of the first Steadicam shots, yeah. which was in Bound for Glory. You you actually like went on top. Uh, am I right in saying that you went on top of a train or something in in that movie? Is that oh, how? Oh sure. It? Yeah. Oh yeah. Now, that was yeah. a real train, and um, yeah. working with real trains in those days, uh, we got a. Little, uh, behind schedule, uh, pretty bad, you know. I want to get to talking about medium cool uh, at the very end here, but um, uh, one thing that that I've always been interested in, uh, I was always curious about your credit as visual consultant on American Graffiti. Um, what what did you actually do on on the film? I mean. I was uh, I was I was the director of photography on the film, and um, I think um, later on because it was a a a union a thing, and, um, uh, I I I helped get George into cinema school, and I followed with him. I shot on on his THX film and so forth, and George had, um, to do graffiti. Um, um, he hired a couple of um, um, newsreel guys to do the shooting for him. Yeah. But they, but they didn't give him the confidence that he, he felt he needed. I don't know whether they could have or not, but he, he, he asked me if I could come up, and I was shooting commercials and had all kinds of schedule things, but um, I, he, was, he was kind of desperate. And, of course, Francis uh, Coppola sort of, uh, I think, got George the, the job. Um, and, uh, anyway, to make a long story short, so I would I would fly up there um, and um, helicopter to um, where we were and, and then um, shoot and then come back and um and I did that for most of the film yeah, for so you would kind of give sort of uh, sort of like a sort of like a uh, a little bit of what should should be done by the uh, directors of photography you know, uh, no um, actually uh, i i did it i the, mine mostly was the camera was in my hand uh most all the time a mm. couple of times couple of times we had another thing and um uh, i have a fairly good piece of the movie and i, I still get checks from it believe it or not. <laughs> that's good too because it was one of the most profitable movies of all time yeah. so uh and, and that's that's great you know the cigarette uh, uh cigarette pad under his uh, t-shirt rolled up mm-hmm. under his t-shirt. that's my that was my my idea and then that was your another, idea yeah, and there's another scene. Um, um, Kenny Clark and uh, and uh, what, Charles Martin Smith. Anyway, they were sitting down um, after outside the, uh, the the restaurant, you know, and, and the um, and they had had all kinds of adventures, and she, and she was saying, "Say, I really," she said, "I have, I really had a good time." Uh, uh, we saw uh, your card in it. I watched you throw up, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I and then um, and I, 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 I've shot a couple of things with Candy Clark uh, about graffiti. You know, we did them for George. We mm-hmm. have one, one little short film that, that um, um, where they they have a graffiti day up in um, Modesto. Um, where they reenact certain scenes, um, get, getting the car ready and police car. Well, oh yeah, when they when they jerk the axle out of the police car, and we reenacted that. And anyway, I made. <laughs> oh wow! 
I made this little film for George. In fact, he he wrote me a letter. One second. I just happened to, I just happened to see this today because I'm cleaning up some papers. But he said, um, uh, "Thank you for the little movie on American graffiti. I was amazed that you seem to have gone." to the Modesto and Petaluma and made such a wonderful testament to the longevity of our efforts way back when. It was funny, touching, and I loved it. It was great to see you in Sausalito and fun to have dinner. Also, I'm happy you were able to make it uh, to the opening of the school. The opening hmm. of the school is when he gave the school 26 million bucks. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> I, when, he was, when he was in Sausalito, I was always getting some Lifetime Achievement Award, and he was the one that made the speech. So, um, hmm. but He's been a very fair, decent, good guy all these years since he was a kid. Hmm. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um uh, you know, when I talk about your career, you know, I'm just like, again, you know, like I'm just, I, again and again, I'm like blown away by the the, the movies that you've done and, and how much they mean to me and to all of us. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I feel like I could talk to you for hours about each movie, but I have to like move on to, uh, uh, to, um, Cuckoo's Nest to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, I know you, you, you know, you're you're technically linked with Bill Butler on that on that as cinematographers on that production. But I'm interested in like the separation of the work there, and also <clears throat> I'm interested in also how the process of shooting that piece in a real operating mental facility, you know, really infused itself into the into the film was the was the work really split down the middle between you and oh, Bill no, Butler? Oh no, 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 not at all, not at all. Not yeah, at all. it was just a little bit left. It wasn't just Bill Butler. Uh, uh, Bill Fraker came up and shot the stuff on the boat. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it was. Um, there was some um, um, everything. You know. Ninety percent of the shot in film was shot, and there were some invisible to this day uh, situations that um, uh, that obliged um, uh, them to uh, to can me, and that, I was fired. Um, and um, and no you one. You were left. fired from Cuckoo's Nest. Oh yeah. Why did that happen? It seems to me oh, like you and Milos Norman would have been like total, total, uh, you know, totally together. Uh, no, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I over the years, um, I've had some. Uh, I do know that. Uh, um, I do know later to talk to this woman in the accounting department that the uh, FBI was up there asking questions about me. And I was I would, always curious about if you've ever seen like an FBI file on yourself or so forth. I figured oh, they, yeah. they... I've got hmm. 600 pages. <laughs> <laughs> that and, does not surprise I, me, Haskell, I, 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 I have to tell I, you. I, yeah. <laughs> Oh well. So um but so so that's the reason you think? Well, I don't know for sure. I mean, mm. uh, Saul Zance, uh uh I mean all of the people the people who fired me um um what's the what's the kid's name? Um um the, the famous older actor whose son is a producer um Oh, you're talking about Michael Douglas. Uh, right? Michael, my, oh yeah, Michael. And he, he was almost in tears when he said that he has to let me go. What shot? Is, uh, what of your work actually survives in Cuckoo's Nest? The, uh, there are a couple. Uh, there are about three scenes that are not mine. Mostly uh, night scenes where uh, they 
the, the, their guys were going out some windows, and then there was a scene, um, of course, the stuff on the boat. Um, right. That's Bill, that's William Fraker's. William yeah. Fraker uh, was, a, was a guest on our show. Well, I really only have two other movies to ask you about, so if you can be patient. I, I'm really curious about Days of Heaven, which I have to tell you, I'm sure you've heard it before. It's probably the most beautiful film I've ever seen. But I understand there's kind of a controversy surrounding Mr. Alamendros' contribution to the film. No, 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 no. Is, is there no? Well, it, it isn't with Terry Malick, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not with Terry Malick, you know. Um, Nestor, um, first place, Nestor a very, was a very good friend of mine. And, mm-hmm. um, and, the, and, and the reason I was called in is because... Um, uh, two things were happening. Um, they were extremely far behind. Nestor had to go get a commitment to, to Truffaut. He asked me uh, if I could go up there and shoot. And so I went up there, and um, I talked with N- Nestor, and, and the, the Nestor said, well, um, I remember a, a, no, a no diffusion and I only do um, available light. Mm. Okay. So, um, so then I didn't say to him. Um, I didn't say to him the the remark that um, <laughs> that Owen Roisman has. Yeah, what's available on the truck? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, but um, uh, Nestor was. Nestor was a lover, and Terry was really just a peaceful nature guy, and he wouldn't wouldn't work on getting enough shots done. He was not, um, he just didn't. The crew was going nuts because they they. Um, <laughs> so then, when Nestor left, we we started to get things done. A lot of this, the first stuff. I was doing was, <coughs> is, is matching and finishing up some scenes that they hadn't that that part of it he shot. Um, and, okay. Um, wow, that uh, must have been tough. But but it was no it was no, the only conflict was that um, was when I realized how much uh, that such a huge part of the the film uh, I shot, and there was no there was no ideas of of credit or anything. Um, right. I said. I mean, I as, the, as it stands, you're just additional photography or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so at that, at that time, I I asked that um, it would be Nestor and me as co-photographers, and so then. Um, and uh, Nestor, and I'm trying to think if the producer was a good friend of mine. Was it Bert, Bert Schneider? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bert Schneider. Yeah. Bert, Bert Schneider was his name. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, and, and, he, and he said, look, Haskell, you got an uh, Oscar already. What, what, you, what, you, what, what you, uh, you know, go ahead with, uh, forget it. So, so, <laughs> I, so, um, so, I, so I did, but I did make a little uh, squawk in there and uh, and but I but it never was the squawk I was always able to talk to Nestor and okay just talk about it as as a as a practical um, thing which uh, it didn't which damage I, I, your friendship with Nestor not at all you know again that that movie is just that movie well, is one, just of the, one of the things stunning. about that when we think about it is we were shot mostly in this Great northern latitude, so we had a lot it of. It was up in Canada, right? You were up in Canada. Yeah, the same catch you on in northern. And what you have there is like, like a long what we used to call mystic hours, where mm. it's neither it's neither light or night or day. You know, just a sort of a beautiful light, and. Um, and it lasts, Is it sort of like the magic hour, but longer? Like it's yeah, like you know the exactly. magic hour. They talk about the magic hour, like that that hour where things 
things go into uh, silhouette and everything, but it's longer? Is that it? Exactly, exactly. Okay. I have to ask you uh, uh, one more one more of your movies before I talk about Medium Cool, because that's the way I want to close this interview. Uh, another favorite uh, uh, movie of mine is, is Mate One, and I know that, that that's something that's probably pretty close to your heart in that in that it, it's a movie that kind of dovetails into your interest in in terms of uh, workers' rights and so forth. Um, uh, but uh, those scenes inside the coal mines are some of the most striking scenes I've ever seen ever filmed. What was it like, I mean, going into the coal mines? And also, did you learn a lot about the coal, the horrors uh, that coal yeah. workers have to go through and so forth? Yes. Uh, um, first, uh, at the beginning of you talking about it, you said all the important things of why I really like uh, Mate One. Uh, the particular problem of working in a coal mine. Um, um, one of the one of the things I I, I found some a little aluminum dust like stuff that I could. Uh, spray or, or throw onto the to the coal, and then also wet the coal. So there were there were some. So there was contrast. Some so little was... uh, light on the thing, coal, mm-hmm. and then um, um, then also the the headlamps, the regular the the, um, the the kind of headlamps they had were gas driven. Mm-hmm. And so I, uh, I had someone rig them up so that they they just put out a lot more poop than than normal. And then I right. had I, and I had some off camera little lights that looked like it can be coming from another actor uh, to um, to give some light somewhere, you know. Mm. Uh, but actually working having dark people in a coal mine with any without any electricity <laughs> is a photographic challenge that's for sure oh i mean yeah. i you you can sense it while watching it you're like how did they get this like how, how you know and uh and then also you know also on top of that just outside of the coal mines in the you know west virginia uh, did you shoot it in west virginia Yes, I have. Yeah. Um, just uh, the outside shots uh, with that sort of, uh, I guess there's a sort of a gauzy kind of feeling on on some of those shots of like, uh, I don't, I don't want to say they make the shots look antiquated, but uh, uh, they just, they just give a special feeling to, to ever, to that landscape. Um I'm just talking about the movie now. Uh, this isn't really leading up to a question, but uh, I just love uh, love the look of that movie, and I love the fact that that movie was done on such a low budget. But it looks so uh, it looks like it was it looks like a movie that that cost fifteen million dollars instead of it's pr- probably pretty low cost. I don't know how much it costs yeah. to make, but. Uh, I know that that was your first. That was your first movie with John Sayles. Do you look at John Sayles as sort of a kindred spirit? Oh yes, I learned a lot from John. I learned a lot from him. John is um, in a full encyclopedia on all kinds of subjects, you know. And, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, but actually, primarily a writer. He doesn't easily think in images, uh, you know. Um, so does that does he? So as a director, he did he lean on on you in the in that film and also in Rowan Inish and and uh, and and Limbo. I know you did Limbo together, which is also yeah. all all of those are great movies. But uh, do you feel like he le- leans on his cinematographer to to uh, to help out with the? Visuals, or is, is that just something that every director does? Like, yeah, well, he look at he he does give me, he does listen to me, uh, but he is a very very 
uh, strong and good, um, not just writer, but director as well. So that sometimes when I think he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing when he says about this shot, I'll, I'll do it to my best ability and then I might find out that he was right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, because that a good kind of relationship, um, you can uh, it, it, it can make you smarter. And yeah. But also, ultimately, also um, the director is the boss as far as the director, as far as the shooter. You know. I was always curious, even though you've been very active as a director of documentaries all throughout your career. You really never returned to directing narrative films after doing Medium Cool. Uh, is there a reason for that? Um, yeah. Uh, to, to direct and write and direct your own uh, narrative film, you need money. Mm. And uh, sizable money. I did, I, I did make Latino, uh, uh, which... Um, well, you know, which is used uh, widely and exposes a period of our history, uh, and made that under actually actually under, under gunfire a lot of it. Mm. That's one I need to catch up on. I haven't seen that. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good film, and um, and some reviewers like Charles Krautheimer or something thought thought it was. Um, a dangerous film when it played in Washington, D.C., because at that time the government denied that there was such a thing as Contras and that we didn't supply these these mercenary people with weapons to um, to kill people in, in uh, Nicaragua and all that stuff, you know. Right. Okay. In fact, uh, in fact uh, Reagan called them... Uh, the moral equivalent of our founding fathers when they finally admitted that they had that we were supporting the Contras. Ah, yeah, right. I remember that as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, well, uh, with uh, well, uh, I'm interested in Latino here for just a second because it's a it's a movie that I didn't uh, I haven't really ever investigated. Is there? Is there uh, and uh, and then I'm just uh, I'm also going to lump this in with your documentary work because a lot of your documentary work, which you've been very very active in documentaries over the past uh, over your entire career, like from the bus all the way to the present day, uh, and the bus just to let uh, viewers uh, listeners know the bus is is the movie that you did uh, uh, as part of the. Uh, you were on the bus going up to uh, where? You were going to, uh, were you going to Montgomery or? Uh, uh, no, we went to the March on Washington where, right. where uh, Martin Luther King made his, what they call it, I Have a Dream speech, but uh, it was much more to the speech, yeah. Right, was, so. so people, uh, came all, is, people came from all over the country, uh, to 250,000 people in Washington, D.C., I want to talk about like your documentary work. It just feels like it's hard to see it. And is there any? Do you do you feel like it's worth pursuing? Or well, of course you do because you made the movies. But but do you? It'd be great to see a Haskell Wexler documentary box set. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't do you? Do you feel like there there'd be any way to to facilitate that uh, a, a box set of of your documentary work because it's really fascinating all the stuff that you've done uh, that that's a little harder to see than your narrative work. Um, yeah, uh, a few months ago I was honored uh, in France in power France. Um, I forget the name of the outfit, but anyway, um, Cinema uh, du Real. Cinema du Real. And right. um, they made, um, a, um, Pam Yates uh, made a uh, film called C Citizen... Citizen Rebel, or Rebel Citizen, which Rebel that's Citizen, another yeah. thing I was going to talk about was Pamela Yates. This is also for the listeners. 
Pamela Yates has a movie that's coming out uh, that's actually premiering at this year's New York Film Festival uh, called uh, Rebel Citizen that's about you. Uh, and so that's actually how that came about, uh, was this was this honor that this she, she followed you. Uh, well, uh, actually, I was supposed to go there, and so uh, what she did is she did a two-and-a-half-hour um, interview with me, and and then since I'd worked with Pamela on a number of films together, including one about the Contras, uh, mm-hmm. that, um, uh, and then also I did a, a Skype to France where they had me yakking to the people on the big screen for the Skype. But anyway, that film was just accepted at the the New York Film Festival. Pants. Right. It's, it's so fun. that's going to include clips from the bus and uh, and uh, your other uh, duck. It, mi- duck. it misses a lot of the ones I thought ought to be there, but that's enough, you know. That first scene in Medium Cool really seems to sum up a central concern of yours as both an activist and as an artist. There's Robert Forrester and Peter Bonners is, are out there on the streets filming the aftermath of an accident, and then, then only then, deciding to call for an ambulance. Uh, do you see what I mean there? Do you, do you, is, is that something that that kind of that kind of uh, line between just filming something and then actually deciding to get involved in it. Is that yeah, something? Absolutely, is, absolutely. Yeah, well, you're, you're correct. And that was not not the view I have, but um, but I do know that that media often has that move is to, is to get the shot and um, get them. Uh, there is a scene... Uh, on that same scene at the end, there's a bridge that goes over the over the wreck, and you'll see a man walking, and he, and, and he walks, and he stops, and he gives a look down at this accident, and then just walks at the same place away down there. And, um, and he was someone that I had sent up on the bridge to do that, because I wanted to, in a sense, say that many people, you know, just certain things, they don't want to get involved, you know. They look at it, and and, uh, and I, on some framings, it cuts a little top of the frame of that, I know. <laughs> but that was, but the first thing you said is, is correct. I did want to talk about um, about that. Uh, aspect of not uh, having direct human connection to something that you photograph. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you go, go ahead. It feels like it feels like you've always been able to transcend that line between just photographing something and just uh, and then actually getting involved. And uh, that's that's to me is why you're like one of the heroes of oh. movies. Um, uh, and, uh, the final question I want to ask you is, is this, do you have a favorite shot of your, uh, in, uh, of, you know, of all the work that you've done? <laughs> uh, I can't think of it now. <laughs> I do, there's a, there's a shot, a st- uh, I have a still picture in my bedroom of a big field of yellow flowers and a and a and a and a father walking through it with his son, and, mm-hmm. and in that scene in Medium Cool, he's telling the son about women and um, and how they you know they, they sort of want to take over the thing. They get these high eddies, but but don't you let them, son. And um, and uh, he's giving him um, that idea, and I sort of. I I made a still picture of that frame because of some of the things between me and my wife. <laughs> mm, wow. My wife. So that favorite. so that's the one that sticks out for you, and it's hanging in your bedroom, so you do have it framed. Wow. 
Yeah, well, I, well, this is a still my wife's favorite scene is when uh, Forster's in the bed with uh, Mariana Hill, and apparently he just left her, you know, sexually or something. He, and he and she and he's have his hand on his hip and on his head, and she said, uh, you know, you're just a, 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 a selfish. Um, um, Egotistical, um, something cameraman, you know. Mm. 